Evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us here tonight at Warp and Woof Radio, where in the last month plus, we have been interacting with an awful lot of students that I've had in the past in one form or another. I've been teaching junior high through PhD students for over 35 years. And uh, in many respects, uh, one of the things that is true about all of these students that I've had in the past is that they've become friends. And certainly that is the case uh, here tonight as Steve Weber joins us uh, from Florida, actually a professor at Florida State University. Steve, thanks so much for taking the time tonight to join us. Hey, thanks, Mark. It's my pleasure. Glad to be here. Great. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, about your family and uh, what you do? Sure. Um, yeah. So as Mark said, my name is Steve. And uh, my wife and I, Liz, have been married for, oh gosh, um, 16 plus years now. And we've got uh, two girls, Paige and Claire. Paige is 11, Claire's eight. Uh, they both love to swim. Uh, they were born in Michigan, but largely we've raised them here in Tallahassee. Um, and uh, the transition that brought us here was um, starting to work at Florida State as a, as a professor, assistant professor there in 2012. And, um, and uh, then tenure just two years ago. So um, I love to teach, um, I love design, I love architecture. Uh, I currently teach a blend of design classes uh, that are more creatively focused in the design studio. And then I also teach technical classes, uh, construction systems and documentation. Um, and I teach both under, upper level undergraduate courses as well as grad classes. Mm. And, and you've also just ahead. published a yeah. book too. Yes, that's, that's right. So uh, October of last year, it was a long endeavor, um, it was about a three-year process uh, to, to write the book, uh, Interior Design Fundamentals. And um, it's geared towards um, entry-level uh, interior design students. And it covers a range of topics, 12 chapters, um, starting with the really uh, basic things like elements and principles of design, got a little bit of history involved in there, a little bit of environmental psychology in there, um, a chapter on uh, furnishings and finishes, and then another on environmental systems like HVAC and electrical and plumbing and that sort of thing. Mm. So it runs the gamut, um, but it's a, meant to be a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, students in this discipline will take classes, uh, at least one, if not more than one, in each of the topics. Uh, that each of the chapters covers. So as they get into the sophomore and upper level uh, years, uh, they will drill down on each of those topics and go deeper. Nice, great. Well, congratulations on the book. Thank you. Also, congratulations on tenure at such a storied university as Florida State. Thank you, yeah, <laughs> appreciate it. Um, I just wanna say one little thing. I'm not a doctor. Uh, I just have a master's degree. So just for anybody who is watching this. Oh, just so you know that. yeah. All right. Well, we, you know, it's too late now, man. I, That's all right. I, I can't stop the banner now. <laughs> that's all right. Sorry, I didn't catch that earlier. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Uh, you know, this is you certainly are master in the field, and, and that's what's really important to us. I'm, uh, I'm interested in what we're going to talk about tonight because it reminds me of the kinds of things we used to talk about in class. And so, one of the lines I used to riff in class uh, is some goes something like this: "The Creator created creatures who creatively create from creation." Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the things that uh, that you wanted to talk about right away was the issue of creativity mm -hmm. and the necessity of understanding uh, that that was uh, that that's important for you. Yeah, it um, it really is. Um, I remember as a high school student, um, I, I think I knew pretty early that I was interested in architecture. And I um, remember sitting down with, um, you know, count, you know, professional counselor uh, saying, hey, what do you want to do in college and that sort of thing? And uh, it may have been Mr. Masterson, actually, that um, pro uh, prompted this, uh, this train of thought. And, um, and I said, I don't know. Um, and he said, well, what do, you, what do you enjoy? And then also, what are you good at? And I said, well, I'm good at math and I really enjoy physics, but I really love art. I was taking private uh, painting classes and and things with uh, Gail Palpin, um, and on Saturdays, and I think that actually began fostering that uh, that path um, towards towards architecture and design. And so, taking your class, um, getting a you know excellent foundation of worldview uh, from a Christian point of view of analyzing and thinking about everything that I see and am exposed to through the lens of the Bible, uh, I was exposed to that idea, you know of you know, God is a creator and he has created us, his creatures, and we now creatively 
create our own things, right? And so that is what got me interested, I think, in architecture and design. Um, from there, it was, you know, Lawrence Psychological University, um, where I got my bachelor's in architecture and interior design, and then a master's in architecture. Uh, and I can remember, um, man, being up so late in the studio. Um, and it, I wasn't the only one. It was me and, you know, a handful of other folks that were uh, just maybe a little masochistic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not letting anything go, you know, wanting to get the projects as perfect as we can get them. And I can remember this one semester um, having a professor where, you know, nothing was ever done. And he has a, had a really, I'll call, to put it nicely, a really strong work ethic, uh, <laughs> <laughs> crack, cracking the whip on us. And we would um, stay up hours and hours and hours uh, to get our projects complete. And I remember walking into the final week leading up to deadlines and looking at the list of drawings that I had to do and comparing it to my other commitments of classes and work and that sort of thing and realizing, okay, if I, it's gonna take me this many hours to get this done and this done and so on and realizing, okay, I've got three hours a night to sleep uh, to get this all done and um, and got it done, you know, but placing in the midst of that, placing the priority on, you know, Lord, this is tough and the only way I'm gonna get through it is with your help, you know, with your strength. And so I would, you know, read a bit of the Bible each day and and pray, and then just jump right into work. And thankfully had a couple other uh, classmates around me that were doing similar things. And so we could keep each other going. Uh, but I remember sitting up in the studio building models and cause that was the only thing I could do late at night when I was really tired, doing things mechanical with your fingers, building these models help, help to keep me awake. And as I was working, you know, listening to music and praying and stuff at the same time saying, Lord, I, this is a lot of work, but I love it. You know, I love doing this. I don't know that I want to spend, stay up this late for every day of my life in my profession, but I really love this work. And, you know, would you use me to change this? You know, could I somehow make a tremendous difference in this discipline, in this profession someday? You know, I mind. I imagine becoming a famous architect, a famous designer, you know, and being that, um, you know, we actually abbreviate it star architect, uh, somebody who, you know, designs these big, beautiful buildings. And lo and behold, that's not exa that's not at all what he had me do. <laughs> you know, I practiced for 12 years um, and, and enjoyed it. Really, really did enjoy a lot of it. And um, you know, then transitioned into the back into the academy and began teaching. And my first position was at Lawrence Tech as an adjunct part time uh, while practicing, and then uh, Eastern Michigan University um, as a full time professor, and then uh, made the transition here to Florida State. And I would say that um, God did answer that prayer mm -hmm. um, in a much more um, meaningful, personal kind of way. I am changing this discipline for the better because I get to I get the privilege of building into the next generation of designers who will then go and and do all those projects and at the same time hopefully get the challenge of thinking challenge their assumptions about life about things that really matter. And um, hopefully um, they would um, invest in what matters for eternity, um, mm -hmm. even beyond, you know, um, their, their chosen professions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As professors, uh, teachers, we um, give part of ourselves to our students and uh, students walk away with a piece of us in them. Uh, that really reminds me of that image making process. And and certainly you're having an impact on students. Uh, in the same way, but it, it it always reminds me that that the essence of that Greek word uh, to imitate uh, it actually comes from a Greek word which which is mimic. Mm -hmm. So that's what the Greek says that you know students are actually mimicking us. Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. You have some really uh, neat colleagues, by the way. I was kind of passing through some of your Facebook pictures today, and uh, you all look like you were having a great time. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, very, uh, very blessed to have the colleagues that I do. Uh, we mm. respect each other, and and we really value each other's company too. Um, we we don't get to always spend as much time together um, as as I would like. I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but um, I wish I could get to know them better outside of the work setting. Um, and we do get opportunities to do that. Um, but I I would love it if it was more because they're wonderful people. And I think um, you know in higher ed uh, you need that. You, yeah. you need uh, you need people that you can rely on um, and that can rely on you um, to either further your research in your in your writing and publications um, or to you know bounce ideas off of when you're wrestling with things in the classroom. 
um, of how to how to present content, how to um, how to challenge students in a positive way to excel and, and rise above uh, some of the challenges that, that they're facing. Um, so, you know, without without them, um, I don't think I would have written that book. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I wouldn't, that book would be possible without uh, without my colleagues, without my coworkers, mm-hmm. because a lot of that content really comes from conversations that I've had with them and things that, that we've worked on together. The collaborative emphasis uh, in a department such as yours, you know, is huge. And it's it's really a marvel. And uh, as you've suggested, you know, you're blessed to be with people like that. That's really neat. Yeah. I'm really glad for you and, and all of that as well. Um, what's, what's fascinating to me is some of the talking points that you had mentioned uh, is this value of design. And I I wanted to spend some time on this because I don't know that people really think about this all that much, how valuable design is and why uh, should we even have this kind of conversation? Can you kind of help us with that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, design, if you can picture a Venn diagram, where on the one side you have science, right? One circle is represented by science. The other, the other circle is represented by art. And where those two circles overlap, that's where you have design. Hmm. Um, Design is different from a fine art in that art is, fine art is meant to exist to convey a message and almost to stand on its own. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be beholden to a, a, an outcome so much, but design does. Design has to function. Design has to work. Design ha- is meant to solve more problems than it creates. And ideally, we don't create problems when we design things well. But there are always unintended consequences. Um, so there are times when you've got good design and bad design, and bad design can actually create problems. Um, you know, one of, one of the conversations we were having just a moment ago, right before we came on, is, you know, what does it mean in the built environment, you know, in in our buildings, in the context of COVID nineteen? Um, are there things that we have done throughout over the decades to solve certain problems that now set us up for other problems right now? And you know the transmission of disease is, is one of these things that um, is going to come to the forefront of our of our design conversation. Um, I think for the years to come, um, even if COVID nineteen fades to the background, this is an issue that we need to grapple with um, and and start to think about what have we done by focusing so much of our effort towards the interior, and then not considering some of these other unintended consequences that we're now facing. Um, you know, back to the value of design. Um, you know. You know the, the value of our interior spaces are so critical because we do spend so much time here, and um, we think about our homes, uh, think about our places of work, our schools. Um, it's you know classrooms are on the inside of buildings, right? They're not on the outside of buildings, um, unless you are, you know, maybe doing like forestry and animal husbandry, and then you're outdoors all the time, <laughs> and that's great. Um, but uh, the majority of people they're indoors, and that's where we spend so much of our time. So to think to overlook the value of the built environment, uh, we do that at our own peril. And mm. um, it, it is aesthetic, right? There is beauty there, um, but there's also function uh, that's behind the beauty. Uh, the beauty doesn't mean so much if the interior doesn't work, right? Mm. If, if we can't, you know, if, um, if, if the interior isn't laid out and built in such a way that um, can actually function for the role that it's meant for, uh, then then the aesthetics uh, aren't as aren't, aren't impactful, so. Mm. Yeah. Um, But design also impacts other things like products, right? Think of your cell phone that you hold. A lot of effort went into designing that cell phone to make Mm. it fit the hand and be usable um, by the greatest number of of people uh, possible. Mm. So that that applies to everything. It it strikes me as as odd, I have to say, that to uh, hear the word design and peril in the same sentence. (laughs) You know, help me to understand that, help other people to understand um, why could, or how could, maybe is a better word, how could design um, be perilous to people? Uh, well, there's there, there's a variety of topics that we can tackle with that. Um, the, the common ones that we use in architecture and interiors is this phrase called health, safety, and welfare. And um, when we think about health, um, one thing that we sometimes don't think about is indoor air quality. 
Um, mm. When you think about you know HVAC systems and the need to do basic things like change filters, um, or to manage um, humidity levels uh, in a in a building, uh, there's a health component to that. Uh, when we talk about safety, uh, we are looking at things such as can someone with a physical disability uh, use the building and be safe at the same time. Mm. Um, all right, let's put this in real extreme terms. Um, in the case of an active shooter on a college campus, are there pl are there a lot of places for that person to hide? Are there places where people who are trying to um, run to safety can get lost or get turned around or find themselves uh, trapped? Okay, so there are things that we do in laying out a building and designing an interior that is, yes, it's beautiful, but at the same time, we're also thinking about sometimes the worst case scenarios. And we're, we're trying to anticipate some of those things. And that, uh, you know, those sorts of things come up in the common dialogue. Um, after 9-11, for example, think about just the way airport security changed. Oh, my. In a, in a major way. And that yeah. is, that's design and architecture. That is, mm. you know, someone using um, their creativity to, to solve a problem. And at the same time, trying to minimize other problems that result from that, right? Like mm -hmm. wait times and sure. delayed flights or somebody not making it to the gate on time. You know, so you know, those things had to get worked out as the design was implemented. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's funny, as you mentioned these things that, you know, those of us who have uh, lived through those kinds of things, whether it be 9-11 specifically or just going through the airport security i mean that's real practical stuff I, you know we all but we don't think about this as design right yeah and and the things that we do tend to think about as design are the things that are more on that beauty side of things and and that is tremendously valuable one of the things that i think as christians that we have um neglected to give attention to is this role of what what is God's intention for beauty? Mm. And is that at all objective? Because in, you know, in the broader realm, we would say, no, beauty is what is in the eyes of the beholder purely. And there is no objectivity to beauty. There is no, um, there, there is no intent so much behind it as it's whatever's beautiful to you. So it becomes very subjective. Um, and, and I would argue that there's more objectivity uh, to beauty than we really think about, than we, I think we equally overlook that as we do some of these more functional things that we sure. kind of just talked about. Well, you know, now you're you're kind of uh, stepping into the theological realm here. You know, this. Uh, Let's do it. Yeah, this <laughs> this concept of uh, there has to be an object for there to be a subject to mirror or reflect. Uh, you know, if you're going to paint a flower, a real flower has to exist for that flower that you're painting for a picture. Uh, to be put up on your wall. So there's got to be some objective reality invested in this. And and quite frankly, it's one, it's the first worldview question. What's real? How mm -hmm. do we know what's real? It's, it doesn't even start with who God is. It starts with what's real. Is there a supernatural world to which we must give an account? And indeed, going back to design and function and strength and all those things coming right out of Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, we have uh, these very clear uh, theological statements of you know, God's practicality and how he designed his world to work. Right. And that, you know, going back to that story um, of being up late in the studio yeah. and asking, you know, asking God to use me to, to positively impact uh, this profession. Um, you know, that's one of those, you know, those are some of those questions that I was wrestling with is I know what I'm putting into this project and this project isn't even going to get built, right? It's mm -hmm. going to simply exist in paper. It's just an academic project that I'm drawing, you know, from my class presentation in a couple of days and building this model. And I'm putting my heart and soul into this thing. This didn't happen randomly. You know, no. this project didn't just fall together and work. Um, you, know, you know, I know what it takes to build a building and and to build a great piece of architecture. And so, you know, I've worked with some really talented firms and they've you know, you know, had the privilege to be on some really awesome projects. And, and I know the team of people that it takes and the minds that it, cut, it takes to come together and then the hands and the feet and the parts and the assembly. And how does that happen randomly? Mm -hmm. It can't. Yeah. Right. It can't. And and then to say, if I put my heart and soul into this thing, if I love this project and it's an inanimate object. Right. 
how much more does God love us that's mm -hmm. living and breathing and bearing his image? I mean, that, you know, the act of going through the design process is what opened my eyes to the gravity of that and the depth of that. Mm -hmm. um, if I had never embarked on this journey of becoming an architect and a designer and now an educator, I would never have really known that to this depth. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for that. Mm -hmm. It's changed my life. That's great. Uh, yeah, it's it's great to hear those kinds of comments, and I I wanted you to know that uh, that Robin uh, wanted to chime in here. Hey, Robin. Uh, <laughs> you uh, you spent a little bit of time in our house. Um, yeah, just a little. When, a little bit, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you were in high school, junior high, high school. So plenty um, of Nerf dart gun gunfights. <laughs> yeah, so some fun. of those Nerf battles we had, right? Yeah. That's really good stuff. Anyway, so Robin wanted to say hello and. She's downstairs yeah. listening to all of this. Um, I, I don't. I would be remiss if we didn't get to our last point here, which is uh, the challenge of teaching design. And I, I value this, you know, a little bit more than everything else, just because I'm an educator too. And I just, I love the concept of uh, teaching and whatever it is that we teach. So, talk to us a little bit about that, the importance of teaching design, and take that where you want it to go. Sure. Um, the the hard part uh the challenge of teaching design is um is striking a balance between outcomes and process um and this is why uh the struggle exists because students at the end of their formal education have a portfolio that shows the work that they did while they're going through their educational process that they then use to gain employment and so the output needs to be good, right? It needs to be beautiful, it needs to be functional. Uh, there, there can't be mistakes in the projects that then show up in the portfolios because now that's a dead giveaway to the uh, prospective employer that says, hey, maybe they didn't get such a very good, you know, didn't get such good education. Uh, if they've got a code violation in that, in that floor plan. Um, so it's gotta work. It's gotta be attractive. It's gotta be beautiful. It's gotta be polished, right? So output outcomes matter, but the thing that is going to carry the student to become now a professional is understanding the process because they're not going to have me or one of my colleagues or another design professor at another university there alongside of them to ask them the questions along the way to ensure that what matters gets done. Because as a professional, you don't have that kind of time. You're expected to do it. You're expected to know it. And yeah, you have mentors and yes, you have supervisors and things that are ensuring that, but Largely, it falls to your shoulders to get it to get it accomplished. So when we are reinforcing process in the design studio and knowledge in the more knowledge focused courses, right, um, that they that the students then need to have to apply, um, they need to be able to fall back to a process that they have learned for themselves that I've reinforced in the studio that works because that process doesn't change. Mm. and the project changes. It could be a house. It could be a hospital. Okay. Um, it could be a restaurant. It could be anything, but the process of designing that project essentially is the same, no matter the complexity, uh, no matter the scope. Okay. No matter the type. And, um, and I, one of the things that I try to instill in, uh, in my students, I say to this to them, knowing that they're not going to fully grasp it until they get out there and start doing it. Um, but I say to them, I said, look, I speak from experience in this, right? I, I, I practice and I know what this is like. I've never been, I've never been able to pick my clients. Hmm. I've never been able to pick my client's budget. Um, sometimes I can't even pick the projects I work on. I'm just assigned to it, right? This is the project that's available. You just finished up on this one. We need you to, to, to now shift over and work on this one, right? So sometimes I don't get that choice either. But what I can choose, what I can control is the process. And if I love the design process, then changes don't bother me. Mm. You know, the, the client can come back and say, the, the cost estimate came back too high. We now need to, what this big fancy uh, phrase called value engineering, which is cost cutting. Uh, we need to value engineer the project down so that we can afford it. That doesn't bother me if I love the process, if I love the act of design. And I'm more geared towards the act of design than I am towards the design output, or at least equally so, then it, I don't get upset. I don't get frustrated um, with having to redesign something because I love design. Right? Um, 
Now that said, I've had plenty of projects in my career that were put on hold and never brought back. Uh, projects that just never got built uh, because of economic downturns and things. And that that that's gut wrenching because you have put your heart and soul into this. And the point is to get it built, right? So that it can positively impact people's lives. So for the design to only exist on paper is also heartbreaking at the same time if it doesn't ever get built. So there's this balance that has to be made between output and process. And that's the that's the thing that I try to instill in, the, in my students is that, you know, love the things you can control, striving towards the goal of getting it built and, and getting it constructed so they can benefit people and have a positive impact on their on their daily lives. When you talk about the concept of process, I'm, the word that keeps running around in my mind is the word tools. So are you basically giving your students tools to work with for the rest of their lives? Yes. In a nutshell, yeah, that's 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 it, um, and you know, and again, connecting it back to that that early story of design process, you know, that that act of if we, I'm trying to imagine what it must have been like for God to create, mm. you know, everything from you know the celestial bodies all the way down to the the cells within our within us, um, and what he was, what of himself, of his heart, of his emotion, right, um, that he must have been putting into all of it because um, it reflects him, right? It, it shows his, it reflects his glory. We can see evidence of his existence um, and who he is in all of this. Um, so I can, I can only imagine what it what must have felt like for him to do that. But I can imagine a little bit better having done it. So great. Uh, Some great. friends here. Hey, Greg. Good to see you. Uh, Greg is, a, is my cousin. Um, oh, nice. And uh, and Liz is my cousin, and they uh, just had a baby boy, Isaac. He's just a few months old. So, thanks for thanks nice. for jumping in, guys. Yeah, for for joining us here for a moment. We're you know again grateful for the time that you've spent here tonight. I have uh, another question here, and I don't I don't know if you want to. We just have a couple minutes left. To see yeah. if what you can uh, do with this. What do you think of the book, A Pattern of Language? Are you familiar with that? Yes, um, I think it's a wonderful book. Um, it's it's one of these. Uh, it's be, if it hasn't become it already, uh, it, I think it soon will become one of these, um, you know, linchpins or, or um, bedrock um, uh, publications for for design. Um, and a pattern language drives at a lot of the why of design um, and the how of design at the same time. It really does an amazing job of. Of, of getting at those uh, really important topics. And, and so um, it's, it, it starts to break down what we start to see in, in, in space, in, in built, in built space, not out there in space, but, you know, in our, in our built environment. Um, and it, it is really interesting to see how these observations translate into a variety of building types, variety of interior spatial types, um, and also across um, different, um, design components. So it could be everything from something very small to something very large, right? These are principles that are carried through uh, a variety of types of design. So um, yeah, Pattern Language is a great, great book. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, this The question came from Trish. Uh, thanks, Trish, uh, for your, oops, wrong one here. Thanks, Trish, for, for asking that question. And uh, here's one more, another comment. Oh, thanks, Marty. This is my stepdad. Um, he also went to Lawrence Tech uh, for mechanical go. engineering. Um, go. Great. So well, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us here tonight, Marty. We're grateful for your presence here as well. And uh, thanks uh, to you, Steve, for taking some time here with us tonight. We usually try to keep these uh, interviews within 30 minutes so people can think about how much time to spend and things like this. Um, you know, in 30 seconds, uh, tell everybody what you want them to make sure they don't miss from this uh, this interview tonight. Um, I guess what I, what I would say is uh, you know, design is all around us. Um, some of it is made by humans and uh, and some is made by God. Um, when you think about it, all of it is made by by God. Um, it's because uh, God gives us the um, the impetus to for humans to design and make and create. Um, and I would hope that if you're listening to this, that this is something that maybe is 
on your mind um, of you know where did this come from, um, and what uh, what do I what do I share in common um, in the design process um, with with the creator? And I think that we can connect um, in that process and on that level of um, of understanding you know the the emotion that goes into the creative process and what we imprint of ourselves on uh, the things that we make. That's fantastic. And it takes us back really to the very first thing we talked about, which is the creator created creatures who creatively create from creation. Steve Weber from Florida State University, professor of interior architectural design. We're grateful for your presence tonight, everybody. Thank you for joining us. On Wednesday, we will have another interview, this one with an apologetics professor, uh, one uh, somebody who is going to share with us a view of what it means to think about things inside out. Make sure to join us on Wednesday. That'll be Wednesday afternoon. We'll archive all of this. Of course, we have these in MP3, MP4 if you're interested, but you can go to our Cominius YouTube channel to see any of these interviews we've been having over the last month plus, and of course, uh, many more of those over the last four plus years since 2016. Thanks for joining us here tonight at Warp and Woof Radio. We're grateful for your attendance, and we'll look forward to the next time.